Social media is a huge part of the story. There's no question. You know, I wrote about it in the first book. And, you know, Jonathan Haidt, Gene Twenge have been talking about it for eight years now. And they've brought rigor and important research to show that that has distracting kids from their social world is bad. And getting them, you know, making them, you know, getting the dopamine hit, dopamine hit and the, you know, you know, the, the anxious, you know, worry about who's going to write me back and when, and then getting the dopamine hit up when they get that response and that whole cycle. There's no question that plays on our natural sort of, you know, propensities for addiction um, and and makes kids more anxious. But I I think it's part of what we're seeing. I don't think it's the whole story. And the, the reason I don't think it's the whole story is a few things. First of all, childhood mental health has been, and adolescent mental health has been in precipitous decline in this country since the 1950s. So how do they measure yeah. that? So from let's say nineteen by every measure, by the way, but let's say take between nineteen fifty five and nineteen eighty eight, the rates of adolescent suicide quadrupled. So that's just one measure, but there are many. I mean, we've seen it from non suicidal self harm, suicidal self harm. All of these rates have gone up for adolescents. Um, but they but they've been in decline for mental health in this you know of teens has been in decline for years. There's also some other statistics or some other reasons. I don't think phones explain the whole story. One of them is that in 2016, the CDC came out with a report, and they said that one in six kids between the ages of two and eight, these aren't kids with smartphones, between the ages of two and eight, one in six kids had a mental health or behavioral diagnosis. That's a lot of kids. That's a lot of kids with a mental health diagnosis, right? Do you think that it factors parents with mental health issues? And there's, I think, more adults are anxious, More adults are suffering from anxiety and depression, at least diagnosed anxiety and depression now than ever before. I think adults are absolutely passing on their anxiety to their kids. And actually, we're seeing that in, you know, Jean Twenge came out with this book, Generations. And one of the things she said in it is that boys, even though teenage girls have the worst mental health in general, boys from liberal families had worse mental health than girls from conservative families in terms of anxiety and depression. So why should that be? We know the girls are on social media more, right? Mm-hmm. Boys, you know, that's not their thing, right? They're they're into video games or whatever. But um, I think part of the reason is what you said. There are certain families that are passing on anxiety about things like climate change. But I also think um, it shows that it's in the environment we're giving them. We're not giving kids a healthy life, right? We think that we can give them an unhealthy life and just pour in the mental health resources and remediate, but it doesn't work like that. And then the last reason I don't think that phones totally explain everything or, or social media is because they're in societies where they use just as much social media. It's not great for their, the kids' mental health, no doubt, but they have much better rates of anxiety and depression than we do. Countries like Japan and Israel, where kids have more independence, they have more freedom, they have more. They're able to take more risks on their own, and they they walk home from school and it, they do all kinds of you know jobs outside of the house, uh, like run errands for the family, and um, they get a feeling of first of all sh- short term joy and long term satisfaction from being able to take risks, see what they can handle, but also a feeling of of, of efficacy in the world. So th- that's an interesting t- t- statistic that you were saying that so. Conservative families have less depressed kids. Is that what you're saying? Apparently, boys from depre- from conservative fam sorry boys from liberal families have higher anxiety rates than girls from conservative families. But above, like, if you just looked at the norm, more girls generally yeah. have anxiety. Right. But in conservative families, girls are less anxious than boys from liberal families. That's right, and. I mean, we could speculate as to why. There are lots of proposed reasons for that. But one of the many, you know, things that we might, first of all, we know it's in the environment at that point. It's not an organic, whatever these kids are going through, it's not organic, right? right. So we know it's something we're pouring into their life. And I think one of the things might be that aside from the fact that parents and conservative families may be more comfortable asserting their authority with kids, and that's that's an old finding. We've known for generations now that authoritative parenting means meaning not cold parenting, not cruel, not unloving rules, but rules. Those kids have better mental health. They're happier and they're more successful in all kinds of ways. 
So it may be something to do with comfort with rules, but also they're less likely to turn their kids' lives over to a mental health expert. So what is the speculation as to why rules alleviate anxiety? Is it because there's structure? There's more structure to the world, so seem, things seem less open-ended and less chaotic and... That's right. I think it's something to do with that. Kids need guardrails. They know they're not ready to be in charge. You know, parents today are so quick to put kids in charge. What do you want? Where would you like to go to school? What would you like to eat for dinner? You know, putting kids in charge. Um, but we've known since the 1960s, Diana Bomberin did this research years ago, and it's some of the, mo- it's some of the sturdiest uh, research we have because they've replicated it hundreds of times. And they've shown that loving parents who are also rule-bound, they call them authoritative, not authoritarian, which is the cold, unloving rule-bound, but mm-hmm. the loving and rule-bound parents tend to raise the happiest kids because kids knows there are guardrails. And here's the thing. The people who are making the rules aren't some expert mom hired. They're the people who love me most. They're my parents. Mm. They're the ones in charge. I think that's really comforting to kids. That's interesting because that's not what people think of when they think of authoritarian or authoritative parents. Right. They think of parents that are restricting their children and the children are going to rebel. That's right. I mean, there's there's a lot of really good research on this, but they, it actually doesn't create more rebellious kids. By virtually every metric, they you, they do much better in all you know in all kinds of circumstances and and in all kinds of situations. And the permissive what they used to have was permissive parents and authoritarian parents. Those were the other two extremes. Permissive parents let kids do whatever they wanted, and authoritarian parents you know said obey at all costs, and they were fairly cold. And their kids didn't end up great in terms of mental health. But here's, um, but, you know, today we don't even have permissive parents in, in, you know, in my view. I think we have something even worse. We have permissive parents who are therapeutic, meaning they're always asking kids what they want, but they're, and and they're never asserting their authority, but they're doing something else. They're hovering and surveilling their kids. Mm -hmm. And so it's permissive without the independence. Yeah, there's a, that's a weird one, right? Like the snap maps and stuff yeah. where you're following your kids right. on Snapchat. They're surveilling them. These kids yeah. have no independence. They have no space for mom is not or dad, and it's not doing them any good. Why do you think it is that things have moved in this general direction? Like, why do you think it is that more parents are seeking psychotherapy for their children and that it's having this negative effect. So I think, you know, I'm I'm at the tail end of Gen X, 1978 was the year I was born. And I think with my, you know, we were the high watermark of divorce. And I think a lot of, you know, teenagers my, you know, who grew up when I did, they felt like, you know, my parents were divorced. They weren't there for me. I wish I had had someone I could talk to. And so they sort of naively, and they had good experiences in therapy. And they sort of naively, you know, watched Good Hul- Will Hunting. And they thought, you know, therapy is good for everyone. And they sort of naively turned their kids over to a mental health expert right away. You know, at the first, I talked to moms who signed their kids up for therapy because a cat died, because their grandma died, because basically anything that would happen in their life, even routine events. And yeah, look, having your grandparents die is very sad, but that's not, you know, a unexpected trauma. That's part of life. 